away with words. If you've ever logged on to social media, you're likely familiar with the barrage of tweets, posts, shares that range from criticism and mean tweets to inspiration. So how should we conduct ourselves online? Is it getting better or is it getting worse? Daniel Darling, the executive vice president of communications for NRB and the author of Away With Words will join us to discuss those questions and more. That's all coming up right here, right now. I'm Sam Chen and this is Face the Issues. Good evening and welcome to Face the Issues. I'm your host, Sam Chen. If you've ever logged on to social media, you know the chaos that spans mean tweets to inspiration, that spans political debates to pictures of cute puppies. Social media is how we live our lives today, is how so many of us communicate and get our news, and yet it is so controversial. So is it getting better or getting worse? And how should we conduct ourselves? Daniel Darling is the Senior Vice President of Communications for the National Religious Broadcasters. He's the author of the new book, Away With Words, Using Our Online Conversations for Good. And he joins us here tonight. Dan, welcome to Face the Issues and thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me and I uh, really appreciate being on here to talk about some of these important issues. It's so good to have you. And, and just by way of introduction, you currently serve as Senior Vice President of Communications for NRB. You were previously the Vice President of Communications for the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission with the Southern Baptist uh, Commission. You've written a number of books, the latest being Away With Words. Uh, you're a podcast host, you're a pastor. Is there anything that you haven't done in your life yet? <laughs> Well, there's a lot of things I can't do well, and uh, <laughs> as a Southern Baptist, one of those is dancing, so that's probably the thing I have done. <laughs> <laughs> so we should not cue the music to Footloose at the break. Exactly. That, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't be good for anybody. <laughs> um, Dan, it's such, a, it's such a privilege to have you here, and let's just get right to it. Look, social media, almost everyone if not is on it, knows about it. Um, you know, today you don't even have to have a Twitter account to just go to someone's Twitter profile and take a look at what's being said. Increasingly, so many people are getting their information from social media as a primary source, and they're engaging in debates with social media. Something that began, I remember being in college when Facebook came out, the Facebook, as Mark Zuckerberg called it at the time, <laughs> and it was a, an attempt to build a community among college campuses. And anymore now, it almost seems like it's a place where complete strangers exchange arguments. As you've looked at social media, I'm gonna ask you this, what pushed you to write this book at this point in time? Well, there's a couple of reasons I wanted to write this book. I mean, first of all, I've always been uh, working with words throughout my whole life and career, uh, whether it's uh, writing books or working in communications or as a pastor, writing sermons, speaking, uh, hosting podcasts and doing radio and TV work. Uh, so I've always had this love affair with words. Uh, I, I'm an avid reader and I have been since I was uh, a kid. Um, and I'm intrigued by how much you know, the Christian faith talks about words. We have a God who speaks. Uh, and one of the things that distinguishes human beings is the high level of communication that we have uh, as image bearers. We, we um, communicate because we have a communicating God. And the Bible has a lot to say about the shape of our words. And then uh, also, as you uh, alluded to, we live in this digital age where uh, it's never been easier to publish. With a few uh, taps of our thumbs or strokes on a keyboard, we can really publish a message to the world. So the question I was wanting to think through is, how do we steward this moment? How do we um, handle our words online? Uh, the internet is here to stay. Social media is not gonna go anywhere. And so how do we live in this moment well, and how do we use our words well? And I, I like the, the way you coined the frame, the uh, phrase, the power of the thumb, uh, which yeah. I, I love that. And Dan, in the book, you write that platforms change over time, but that communication and words really haven't. I mean, is this people often look and I get asked this as a political scientist. People say, is this the worst our politics has ever been? 
And I generally point back to, well, there was a time where the vice president of the United States shot the former secretary of the treasury. Right. Uh, it's, and people say the same about communications. Is this the worst it's ever been in the digital era? From for you, what have you? Is this getting worse? Is it getting better? Is this the worst it's been? You know, I, it's hard to answer that question. Part of me wants to say yes, and part of me wants to say no. Uh, the part that wants me to say no, uh, as an as an avid reader of history is that we we have always had a robust debate in this country. We've had, um, always, when you think about our politics, we've had really nasty campaigns, mm-hmm. uh, even back to the, you know, I'm reading right now about the uh, presidential campaign of 1800 with Jefferson and Adams and how nasty that was. It went to the House. We didn't know who the president was going to be. Um, so I want to say we've always had this. Uh, and as long as humans have been uh, been alive, there have always been um, instability and, and all of these things. At the same time, I want to say it is as worse than it's ever been because we're more, I, I think we're more aware of the terribleness of our discourse. Uh, we're, we're more, more things are in front of us. I mean, we, we know now about anything bad that happens. It just kind of scrolls across our timeline and it picks up national news, right? So if somebody if a, if a state legislator says something crazy in you know a state five states away, we may not have cared about it ten years ago, but now we know because it it just kind of multiplies around the internet. And so in some ways, I think it is worse. I also think we're we're getting more tribalized into our sort of echo chambers and bubbles in ways that we don't relate to one another. I'm going to ask about that the idea of echo chambers. I mean, is social media made? The, do you think social media has contributed to this? Or is this a human tendency that we are now just seeing because of social media? I think, again, the answer to that is both. I think one of the things that makes us so surprised about how toxic social media is it's bringing to the surface what we already knew about human nature, right? This this myth that uh, when Twitter and Facebook and all these platforms were created was that it's going to just bring the world together in this lovely way, which was kind of a naive vision of humans, which actually brings out our best and our worst. At the same time, I do think we're sorting uh, into our tribes in ways that are unhealthy, um, particularly the way that we get our news. Uh, we we can we can curate news that only matches our ideological preferences, that only tells us news we want to hear, um, and we can ignore news that might uh, challenge us or, or information that might challenge us. And this is all coming at a time when there's profound distrust of almost every institution in public life, from mm-hmm. uh, the media, to the church, to government, uh, even s- sports leagues, uh, you know, business, there's very little distrust. So you have the kind of the deregulation of information and the acceleration of distrust it makes for this kind of toxic environment where we really, we, it's not that we just agree, disagree on our opinions. We actually disagree on the nature of what is truth and what the facts are. Dan, does that lead? I mean, obviously, you and I could spend episodes on end talking about the issue of civility and mm-hmm. you know, the question of incivility. A few seasons ago, we had on a, a former representative, Jeff Coleman, who wrote an entire book on the idea of civil combat, uh, of, of how we've lost that. Yeah. Does social media, I mean, what you're saying here about kind of this this distrust of all institutions and then we find ourselves in these silos and echo chambers in social media, does that contribute to some of the vitriol that you see online? Um, or is the vitriol driving that kind of division or is it again a little bit of, of like a circular, yes, each one's driving the other? I think it is circular. I, I think there are perverse incentives uh, online, I think the algorithms uh, incentivize uh, incivility. Uh, they incentivize going viral. So in order to sort of go viral, you have to kind of ramp up your um, your your s- snark and your sarcasm. There's also a, a perverse incentive to kind of um, signal to your tribe that you are one of them. Mm. Uh, this kind of um, almost like fake combat where you're uh, kind of proving yourself to to a tribe in order to get affirmation that that you are one of them. And so the way we do that is we kind of um, uh, call out or own uh, the other side. Uh, there, and and I think we forget that we're in public. There's this weird thing about social media that we both know that we're in public and we there's a performative aspect to a lot of our rage. 
that it's not actually real. It's a, it's a performance for a, a, a people group. And yet we also forget we're in public because we're sitting behind keyboards or, or behind a phone and we, we fail to see the humanity of the people that, with whom we're disagreeing. We, we can, and so what I want to remind people is that that person on the other side of Twitter or Facebook is not just a set of pixels. They're not just an avatar to be crushed. Um, they're people. They're human beings. They're, they're more than their bad opinion. And we are in public and people are watching uh, the way that we interact. And Dan, I mean, you obviously wrote the book for a reason, and your book does largely focus on communication in this current digital social media era. Where's What's your concern if we don't correct this? Uh, what's your concern about where it would go? Well, I think there's a couple of concerns. I think, number one, um, we're even seeing it play out right now that uh, there's just a, uh, there's not an, an ability for the whole country to agree on this, on a shared set of facts. We've always had a, uh, differences of opinion in a robust democracy, uh, and we should continue to have that. And yet we, what's alarming is that we don't agree on a shared set of facts. If you go back to say 9-11, for instance, mm -hmm. we all had d disagreements about how we should respond in different ways, but we had a shared set of facts. We all watched the towers come down. We all saw the same thing at the same time. We well, fast forward 20 years and uh, we don't have that kind of commonality where we we see this the same thing happen and, and agree what truth is. So that makes me nervous. The other thing that makes me nervous is the kind of um, uh, loosening of our social bonds. Uh, I, one silver lining of the pandemic that has been really devastating in so many ways is that I do think we're we're getting to a place where we're appreciating embodied um, gathering, that being together, that that our humanity has to do has to be more than just being mediated through screens. Hmm. That we need more than that, and I think we were headed to a place before the pandemic where, because of our technology, we were having less and less gathering, less and less in person things, and it was sort of having this digital, kind of an effect of digital exhaustion. So I, I hope actually one of the reactions coming out of this is that we'll have a hunger to gather. And every so society needs these kind of social bonds, these these gatherings, these, pl these common places where people who disagree with one another can gather and, and share a common humanity. Yeah. Well, we certainly hope with you. Uh, Dan, I appreciate that insight. When we come back, I want to talk about solutions and how we could amend this and some of the things you propose in your book. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. Our guest tonight, Dan Darling, author of the book, Away with Words, Using Our Online Conversations for Good. Dan, welcome back. I wanna pick up right where we left off. You, we left off talking about your fear and our fears about where this would go if we don't turn it around. Looking at solutions, one of the things I hear a lot is a lot of finger pointing, uh, whether in person or on talk shows or online, about whose responsibility it is to put an end to the vitriol. A lot of finger pointing at the President of the United States or at the, you know, the opposing political parties or, or figures, comedians. We, we're all very quick to call it, call it out. Uh, but is there a degree to which we as individuals, as, as civilians, as citizens, bear some of this responsibility? I think there is. And one of the things I advocate in my book is for all of us within our sphere of influence to, to model a kind of civility and unity that we may not see around us, to kind of be countercultural in that sense. Now, I will say, I think those who have higher degrees of leadership and influence uh, have, a, have a bigger effect and bear more responsibility. So I want to say, if you have a platform, if you're a leader of any kind, to recognize and understand that what you do in moderation, your followers will do in excess. You're, you're not just, even as you stand up for issues or you speak out, which, which I think we should, uh, the way we do it models for the people who follow us a, a kind of discourse. But I, I can not, not necessarily help you know, what the President of the United States 
tweets or what some congressman tweets or a comedian or, uh, you know, anybody like that. But I can control within my sphere of influence the way I treat people, the way I handle these conversations. And one of the things that we misunderstand about civility is a lot of people think that means retreat. They think that civility is incompatible with justice. And the truth is both of those go together. Uh, There's a way to have robust disagreements over serious issues and yet still kind of maintain the humanity of the person that we're disagreeing with in our uh, democracy here. Uh, I think it's vital for us uh, to model that. Civility doesn't mean a lack of courage. It just means that the loudest person in the room may not necessarily be the most brave, that there are ways to articulate and fight for the things we believe in without uh, tearing down uh, the people with whom we disagree. Is there a sense in which courage can actually be demonstrated through civility? I I think so. Uh, And obviously, as a Christian, I draw from from the Bible, and there's a verse that uh, Peter says in 1 Peter, uh, that we should have an answer for every person for the hope that lies within us, but to do it with gentleness and kindness. And what he's saying there is that having answers for the questions of our age, speaking up for the vulnerable, speaking up for issues of truth and, and justice, and yet doing it with doing it with gentleness and kindness. Civility and courage actually go together. I think you see this in some of our big movements uh, throughout history. If you think of the civil rights movement, one of the things that Martin Luther King talked about was human dignity. And he even made it a point to talk about the the dignity of the people he disagreed with, with the um, the white moderates or, or even the uh, segregationists. Uh, and and lifting up their dignity and and calling them to change and saying that uh, change is not just good for the people who are oppressed, but it's also good for the people who are the oppressors. And I think that kind of language is really important, even as we push uh, for change. I you know, in your book, Dan, you write that uh, you cannot live as a creature in God's world without the pursuit of knowledge. Mm. Uh, and I, I couldn't agree more. I, I'm curious. You're, you know, Obviously, social media increasingly is where people are getting their their information, their news from. And there's a big difference between information and the debates that we have over fake news and actually moving towards understanding and wisdom, which is what you're talking about. How do you recommend people to bridge that gap? Well, uh, uh, that's something I think is really important. Uh, You know, there's a real genuine curiosity and a a healthy curiosity for wisdom and knowledge that is is wired into us as human beings. Uh, we are naturally insatiably curious. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between that and a kind of junk food information, mm-hmm. um, a kind of pursuit of tri- of the trivial. And uh, Nicholas Carr, I think, has talked about this a lot in his book called The Shallows, where he talked about how our habit of skimming uh, you know, has really hurt us from actually uh, gaining deep knowledge that we we may know more in this age, but we may not actually be smarter. So I think we have to discipline ourselves to um, away from a kind of junk food information, a kind of being in the know and trying to be on top of every development of every breaking story and a kind of deep and meaningful knowledge that comes from a, a different kind of engagement. Uh, and those two things are at conflict with one another. In other words, um, it's really okay if I'm not up on the latest controversies all the time. If I go on social media and I don't know what people are talking about, I don't have to actually keep up with the Kardashians to have a quest for for knowledge. Because if I do that, it keeps me away from the kind of deep knowledge and deep expertise and deep pursuit of wisdom that comes from other places. I think that's really good advice. And Dan, the other thing you talked about, we talked about in the last segment, the, contra- the way echo chambers and our, our silos contribute to, in many ways, hinder our ability to, to get that knowledge and to process that toward understanding and wisdom. There's been a lot of controversy over how social media platforms are run. I know NRB has issued a statement on Section 230. One of the things that hap- has, has happened is we've developed a new media avenues, whether it's something like OAN uh, as a replacement for Fox News uh, on the conservative side, or now you see the great exodus to parlor, 
One of my cautions has always been, isn't this kind of creating uh, somewhat of a safe space where there's just no, there's no room for outside ideas. Is there a concern? I mean, and those who are making that journey, they tell me, no, this is the solution to the vitriol that they see on social media. I mean, is there, what's your take on that? And I mean, I'm sure you've seen the same thing, the same exodus to platforms like Parler and so forth. Curious about how you assess that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's a really, really pressing question. Um, I think the issues and questions around Section 230 are really important, and I think a lot of good people have some really good ideas and uh, opinions about that. I mean, I will say that um, I do think for for conservatives, one of the things that they are nervous about is a kind of, um, is, is there going to be a time when our content is deemed unsafe or uh, is going to be censored? I think that's a very legit question, particularly if these um, platforms are the kind of highways of information. On the other hand, you ha- really have to sympathize with the platforms because uh, content moderation is very complicated and very complex, and everybody's got a different opinion of how to do it. So that's a really important conversation. Now, speaking to the larger idea of um, echo chambers and going to places where people only affirm our opinion, I'm nervous about that. Um, I mean, I, I have good friends that are making all kinds of decisions that everyone has to decide kind of where they want to do their social media. Uh, but I am nervous about the kind of separate uh, news bubbles that we have created. And I think this exists on the right and the left. I think uh, there's a kind, and I actually read an article in, in uh, Axios that talked about how kind of the, the Twitter world, and, I, and I'm an avid user of Twitter, I love the medium, it's kind of... Um, an isolated world of, of thought leaders and influencers that might be a little bit removed from the kind of um, everyday experiences of everyday people that you might you might see if you're f- filtering through like Facebook or something or or Parler. And I think all of these places can be echo chambers in and of themselves. I think the solution for this is number one to curate a broad list of people that we follow and we pay attention to and to read from a wide variety of news sources so that we're regularly being challenged. And then I also think having a good offline community where we're in conversation, we're in community uh, offline with people who might differ from us, from people who might challenge our perspectives. Uh, I think this is very, very important. If we only seek out new sources and environments that constantly affirm what we already believe, it has uh, two negative effects. Number one, it kind of radicalizes people. Mm -hmm. And you see this on the right and the left that it it kind of radicalizes you toward a position. But the other issue that I think is a, is a real problem is that we don't get the full story of what's going on in the world. We may get a version of it, but we don't see the whole world. And I think that is really unfortunate. I think that is uh, fabulous advice. I was actually going to ask you what advice would you give to our viewers and you beat me to it. Dan Darling, thank you so much for joining us. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. Dan, thank you again for a great conversation today. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, and I know our viewers do too. Uh, In closing, I really want to to come back to your book um, and really highlight it. Again, the book is Away With Words, Using Our Online Conversations for Good. Uh, Dan, you wrote this book obviously for a reason. You unpack so much in it. Do you believe that we can redeem the, our, our communications, especially online? I really do. Uh, I'm actually hopeful. Um, first of all, like I said in the, in the beginning, I think these platforms are here to stay um, and the internet's here to stay. We're not gonna go back to the 1950s. Uh, we're not gonna all suddenly become Amish. So I think we have to ask ourselves, how are we gonna use these well? And I, and I think there is hope here. And I think it starts with each of us um, almost being countercultural in the way we interact, and being countercultural in the in the way that we use platforms, in the way that we practice unity and civility. I do sense that there is a kind of exhaustion out there, both a digital exhaustion, uh, but also an exhaustion with the kind of drama and disunity and incivility. When you kind of get uh, talking to people, y- you see that. So I think there is hope for that. And I uh, uh, you know, we talked about a lot of the negativity on social media, but you think about a lot of the positive ways that it can be leveraged. Um, I had a um, a friend that passed away earlier this year in a tragic auto accident, and some of his friends uh, put up a fundraiser for his widow and their family. And 
it was extraordinary how many people from around the country came and contributed and became a part of that. Uh, that's just one example of the way that social media can be leveraged for good. Or think about really important social movements that where it elevates voices that maybe were not heard before. Um, think about ways that uh, we can leverage for good. And so I, I, I am hopeful. Uh, I, I think in many ways, getting through this pandemic, a lot of the technological innovations have really helped us kind of survive this, right? Uh, that every everyone's technological literacy has been raised because they've had to. You think about the Zoom revolution where everyone from my nine-year-old daughter to my, you know, 67-year-old mother are proficient in, in Zoom and how to communicate. And so I think that's a, a, a plus too. And then your book, you write, words can be used to either injure or inspire. And I certainly think you've inspired and uh, I appreciate you writing that book and joining us. Dan, lastly, if someone wants to get a copy of your book, where can they find it? Well, they can find it at any, any of your favorite retailers uh, or you can just go to my website at danieldarling.com and uh, have we have links there and you can find not only uh, links to your favorite retailers, but some really cool downloadable resources as well. And the website is danieldarling.com. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. And you know, we hope to have you back for a future episode. I'd love to be back. Thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, it's our, pl our pleasure and our privilege. Dan Darling, thank you again. That is all the time that we have tonight. I want to thank Dan for joining us and for writing this book. Again, you can get a copy at danieldarling.com. Thank you to all of you for tuning in. My name is Sam Chen. On behalf of all of us here at Face the Issues, thank you and good night.